So now for this last lecture, we're going to see some uh, useful features of, of Python uh, that uh, they're not really necessary uh, to you, but if uh, your code starts to get a bit more complicated, then it may be useful to learn uh, these features because it can simplify a lot what you need to do. But before that, I will just give you a, a, a brief introduction to the, the base map library. This is a, a, a bit specific, so it's likely that you will not need it. But if you know it exists, then often uh, you can think of uh, use this because this uh, allows you to represent countries and, and the world and so on. So every time you have uh, geographical data, even if you just want to show where your samples come from or get an idea of, of uh, impact of your work or something like that, this makes it easy to, to represent that data. So I'm going to talk a bit about this base map library um, and then uh, some uh, extra additional features of Python that we never used and are not strictly necessary, but may be useful to know. One is uh, parsing program arguments for your script. So your, your Python script can receive arguments from the command line and this allows you to uh, fit your script with some processing pipeline where you use other software or have some shell scripts and so on that you call things in sequence. Uh, <coughs> it also allows your program to become independent from Spider and so on and you can just run it on the command line. Then uh, list comprehension and generators, so uh, I saw a, a simple example of that uh, in the morning. Uh, we saw that, but I'm going to detail this a bit more. Uh, function closure, which is uh, you can have functions inside of other functions and using their uh, uh, values in the outer function. And uh, classes and overloading when you want to organize uh, more complex code. So let's start with uh, the base map library. Uh, we're going to use this example for uh, Earthquake. So this is the same file that, that you have for the, the last exercise, um, where we have uh, major earthquakes in, in the 20th century, and we have uh, latitude, longitude, depth, magnitude, and so on, uh, information like that on this file. So we can read the data. This is all numerical data, so you can read everything into, uh, uh, well, most of it is numerical, but we can read what the, the lines that we are interested in into a numerical array. So in this case, we want the latitude, longitude, and magnitude of the, uh, the earthquake. Uh, alternatively, you can use pandas, for example, load that into a table and, and extract the columns that we want, but we'll just get this, this matrix. And now we have these coordinates, latitude and longitude for the, the earthquake. But we cannot simply uh, plot latitude and longitude without having an adequate projection, otherwise it will not fit with, with the way you, we usually plot the, the countries. Also, it's useful to have some way of drawing the, the actual map. And this you have on the, the base map uh, library. This is uh, uh, an, additional, an addition to uh, matplotlib, so the plotting uh, library. This is not installed by default in Anaconda because the, the data for the, the coastlines and rivers and countries it's about 300 megabytes or something like that. But if you want to use it, you can easily install it in Anaconda with the, with the Conda installer. I don't know if this is up to date, but you can check online the, the installation for Basemap or you can use PIP also to, to install this. PIP is the standard Python uh, manager for, for installing libraries. And what this, uh, this uh, uh, library has is um, the data for the coastlines and the countries, and also the projections for plotting data from latitude and longitude into uh, a, a, a drawing, a representation. So what we do is we create a, a figure, and then we create a map using this base map uh, class, specifying the projection. For example, this Movida projection is uh, this um, projection for the whole world, so this is a, a standard uh, projection, and when we plot this, we can specify the, the central line for longitude, so we'll, we'll have the zero at longitude zero, 
the resolution um, is how detailed are the, the coastlines and the country. So if you're representing the whole world, this can be a coarse resolution, see? If you're uh, zooming in on some parts, you can use a finer resolution for the coastline. And then we draw the uh, coastlines, the continents, we fill the, the, con the continents with uh, uh, different colors for the continents and the, and the ocean and uh, around. We can also draw parallels and meridians, so we have these this representation with the oceans, the, the continents, the, the parallels, and so forth. So this is all automatic with, with this uh, class, so it's easy to, to draw maps. And then there's also th uh, the advantage that we can do a plot. So in this case, I'm using directly latitude and longitude into the, the map. Uh, I specify that I'm plotting in latitude and longitude coordinates. So the, the map object will uh, convert into the positions on the graph. So it will compute the projection to, to make the, uh, the display. And now I, I set the size. So basically the, the magnitude is an exponential. Uh, it's a, a logarithmic scale. So I set the size as 4 raised to the, the magnitude uh, over the, the minimum value on the on the data that I have, but this basically is just to set the scale for the size of, of each uh, circle. You can fine-tune this depending on the, the graph that you want to, to build. Uh, and then uh, I save the figure. This Z order you can use when you're plotting. You can specify the order of drawing each different series. So if you want something to appear on top of uh, another thing or below, you can specify the order. So I put a, a higher order so it would not be below the continents or the oceans, things like that. Um, so this is the representation. Larger circles are uh, uh, earthquakes of higher magnitude. Smaller <coughs> ones have a lower magnitude. And this is the whole data set that we have here. We can also uh, uh, plot regional data. For example, in this, uh, uh, in this page of, of the institute uh, here in Portugal, we have data on um, uh, detected uh, seismic events in the, uh, uh, and this is updated regularly. So we have for, say, the past 24 hours, 48 hours, things like that. And uh, uh, we have the latitude, longitude, depth, and magnitude. And we can uh, parse the, the data from this uh, site. So this page is updated regularly. We can download the, the data and look for the, the tables here this table with the, uh, the values that we want. So basically, we're going to use the, the same parser, the beautiful soup parser. We're going to get this table. Table list med is the, the class name for this uh, table that we have here. And uh, we're going to get for all the rows and all the cells in the row, we're going to extract the latitude, longitude, and depth. Since this is in Portuguese, we have uh, commas instead of, of uh, dots for the, uh, the decimal point, so we replace them before we, we convert to, to a number. So now we, have, we can uh, download uh, immediately the, the data, and we're going to create uh, a map. In this case, we're going to use this LCC, Lambert Conformal Conic Projection. This is useful for uh, a smaller regions, so it's not to represent the whole world. And we can specify the width and height of the, the map in meters. So this would be uh, 40, uh, 40,000 meters, right? Or, uh, so, and, uh, so um, no, 4,000 4, kilometers, 4 million meters, and 3,000 kilometers in height. And uh, we set the, the center in 40 uh, latitude and minus 15 longitude. So this is the center of the map, the size in, the, in meters, and we use this projection, and here we can plot the recent seismic event. So if we put these things together, we can download the data, and uh, so load from the site, and then plot, and every time we run the script, we get the updated image with the, the recent uh, seismic event. So if you want to, to represent geographical data, for anything, this is very easy because you have all the, the information for the coastlines and, and all the, the tools for drawing maps. You just have to plot things with latitude and longitude and you'll get it there. So this would be a, a, an example um, uh, 
from one participant in the course a few years back. Uh, she was monitoring the sedimentation on the uh, on Seychelles in the beaches, so she had buried some some uh, marked stakes where she could see if the sand was increasing or decreasing over time. And she had recorded the GPS coordinates of all the, the samples and so uh, wanted to plot this on, on a map of uh, the, the region. So this is actually a, a satellite photograph from, from Google Maps and the, the first thing we, ca we need to do is to adjust the photograph with the coordinates but this basically we can use Google Maps to measure uh, the GPS coordinates of some specific points, or latitude and longitude, and so we can set uh, the base map, in this case it says uh, 2 kilometers by 3, we have the same projection, and we just need to center the map appropriately, so to figure out what is the coordinates of the center of the image, and we can center the map there, and then we can plot the data, so this is where the, the stakes were, were placed, from the, the GPS data, and we can plot it on on the, the satellite image. So if you have data that has uh, geographical locations, you can easily use this library to show where, uh, where your data points come from. Okay, so now let's uh, leave the, the library and look at uh, um, one thing that may be useful when you finish your script and you want to fit in your uh, program with some other parts of, of processing your data, or just want it to be a standalone program. So you don't need to go into Spider, change things, run things in the console, and so on. To be able to do that, you need to be able to run your program and receive some arguments that tell you, for example, which folder to process, which files to read, something like that. So for this, we're going to uh, use arguments when invoking the program. We're going to see, uh, use uh, for an example, the, that script to plot the tuberculosis load. But we're going to receive, uh, when we run the script, the three letter code for the country, the input file with all the data, and the name of the image to output. So to do this, you can import this argparse uh, library. So what I'm, the way I'm doing this here is tbplot is the, the uh, module we created for drawing these uh, tuberculosis loads. So we're going to import from that module the function that loads data and the function that plots a specific country. We're also going to import the R parts module, this comes with, with Python, that is the module that parses the arguments given to the program. So, and this would be a different module. This is just the, the script that we're going to create and that we can use from the command line to plot uh, tuberculosis load. So if this script is being run, not, not being imported from somewhere else, we can check that if the name uh, variable in this script is main. Then we're going to get a parser object from that library and we're going to specify what arguments we want. So basically these are arguments given by position. We, we want to call the first one country the second one input and the third one output and we can also add uh, help strings so that when someone uses our, our script for example uh, to use the script from the command line this is not the, the Python interpreter this is really the, the command line from your operating system to use a Python script you can type Python which is the interpreter followed by the name of the script so Python will run your script and this way you don't need spider running and so on. But if we uh, run our script without uh, the arguments that we specified, this arc parser, when we uh, uh, ask it to parse the arguments, will uh, terminate the, the execution and output uh, the indications of which arguments it is expecting. So since we told the arc parser to expect three arguments, country input and output, and we provided a help string for each of them. This would be the output for the user uh, that uh, it, they must provide these three arguments in sequence in order to use the program. So uh, the way to use the program would be uh, you call Python to run our script and then provide our script with the three parameters. This is the, the string with the code for the country we want to use. 
Note that we are not, we don't need uh, the separators here because this is not Python. This is just what we're writing on the shell. So we're giving uh, the the command for for the shell, and this is just simply copied as string into the uh, the parser that will then uh, fetch the different uh, 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 arguments here. So the code of the country, the file with all the data, and the name of the file we want to output, where we want to generate the graph. So when we do this, our script runs, it will parse the argument, and then from the arguments that are parsed, it will uh, get the input argument. These names uh, can also be accessed as attributes of the, of the object after parsing the argument. So input will have whatever the user provided in the second argument. So in this example, it would be uh, this here, db, burden, country, csv. So this is the input file. This is one that's used for loading the data. And then we call the plot country function on this table with the country, uh, which is the first argument, so that uh, PRT there, and then the output, which is the file we want to write. It. So this is basically we built a wrapper for our code where we can use uh, that allows us to use our program just uh, inserting the uh, the names of the files we want to read and generate and so on. So we di this way we could now uh, include our code into, for example, a larger script that would do several different tasks and then generate the graph. So this is what you need to do basically if you want to be able to use your uh, programs outside Spider and as standalone programs. Now, one uh, very um, useful, uh, or something that we uh, use a lot is to create sequences of values, say lists or uh, uh, sequences for iterating, creating loops, and so on. <coughs> one way of doing this with a function uh, is, uh, is, for example, suppose that we want to create a number of, uh, uh, of values that starts with the base and then increase by, by uh, multiplying by the base. So we want something that grows exponentially. We could create a list, we, we could start with an empty list and then just add to the list uh, the value multiplied by the base. So we, could, we would have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 and so on and we just create a list with all the numbers. But if we need many numbers then we would be occupying a lot of space in memory because we would have a large list. And if we just want to look through the numbers to do some operation with them, we do not need to have them all in memory at the same time. We could just generate them and use them as we need. So these are generator functions. The difference between a generator function and a function we saw so far is that instead of having a return, the return command exits the function and terminates the function, they have a yield uh, statement here. And the, what the yield does is that it returns that value, but you can go back to the function when you iterate through the values in the function. So a generator function can be used in a for loop, and as long as the generator function is yielding new values, then the, f the loop will continue. When the function uh, terminates, then the loop terminates. So this way you can create a function that generates the values you need uh, in your loop, which may be more complex than simply the range or things like that that we use. For example, here we have a, a function called exponential that has the first argument, which is the base, and the number of uh, times we want it to output a number. And the numbers will start with the base and then be multiplied by the base. So we have for example, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on, we are growing exponentially. So we uh, can, uh, uh, in this case, we are using the default value for count, so we have exponential 2, but suppose you need a million of these numbers, you can just add a million there, and you won't have a million numbers in memory. It, it, they will be generated during the loop, and you'll keep uh, generating them. So this is the advantage of using a generator function. You don't have to generate everything in one go. You keep generating the values that you need. Uh, another way of creating a generator, so this is, this is good, the, the function, because it allows you to, do, uh, to write code with whatever complexity that you want. 
However, it is often the case that something which is an expression, a for loop, and a condition is enough to do a lot of, of different things. For example, suppose that we want uh, to uh, uh, output all the, the numbers in this uh, uh, exponential, so from 2 to 2 raised to 10, to the, uh, the power of 10, uh, if they include the digit 1 in the representation of the number. So this would be the expression. We want 2 raised to the power of p. For every p from 1 to, to 10, so 11 will not, it, this will not reach 11, if there is the character 1 in the string representation of this number. So this outputs these values, 16, 128, 512, and 1024. The others, it will not output because 4, 8, 32, 64, and so on, do not have the, num the digit 1. So these do not uh, meet the, the condition. So basically, if you specify it this way, some expression of a variable, the variable in a loop, and a condition, then this will output all the values of this expression for which the condition is true. To, to uh, write this as a generator, uh, you use the uh, parentheses in the beginning and the end. Alternatively, you can create a list with these values. So this is a list comprehension. It's the same principle, but you use the, the square bracket. So anything that you have an expression, a, a for loop, and a condition to test each uh, element, you can write in this way. And it's easy to create a list with whatever elements you want with this notation. Okay. The condition is optional, so you can uh, leave out the condition if you want all of them, which is what we did in the, in the example in the morning. So it was a simpler version with only the, the loop and the value. <coughs> Another useful thing is uh, function closure. So remember when we talked about um, the namespaces, we had the local namespace, then the closure, we skipped that one and then we went to the global and the, the, the basic namespace for, for Python, which is the, the outermost one. So the, the, uh, there is this intermediate namespace that we can use to uh, write functions in, that work inside other functions. So the first, uh, first idea here to remember is that uh, uh, functions are also objects in Python. So you can actually store a function in a variable because uh, it's an object. And you just the the different thing about that is about functions is that they are objects that can be executed because they have this this recipe. So for example, this uh, Fibonacci function that that uh, uh, returns a list with the, the Fibonacci series. We have one, one, two, three, five, and so on. So each number is the sum of the previous two. Uh, you can create this function, it starts with an empty list with uh, A and B and then it will append and return the, uh, the result, the, the list with all the values. But uh, this function is actually an object, so if you ask for example for Fibonacci underscore underscore doc underscore underscore, this is the documentation string that you have there. You can ask for the, the names of the variables that are inside the code, for example. When, the, when Python executes this command, it parses the, the code there and organizes everything. So you can check the names of the variables that exist inside the function. And also, you can create another variable that points to the same function. For example, f equals Fibonacci means that this f variable is another reference to the same object. And now you can use f instead of Fibonacci to execute the function. For example, F30 is the same as Fibonacci 30, and you get the, the results up to 30. So this is one thing. We can, uh, functions are objects. We can create a function and then use it inside a variable and, and transport the function wherever we want. Uh, and now suppose that we created this function, which uh, receives uh, as first argument some function, a vector with the values of x, and the name of an image file, and it will plot the, the function as a function of x, and then write the, uh, to a file. So this can work with any function, as long as the function only needs one argument. 
If the function receives x and returns the values of y, we can plot it because we are providing the values of x, we get y, and we plot the graph. And now suppose that we want to use this function to plot some polynomials with different degrees. We have a useful function in, uh, in NumPy, which is this polyval that receives a vector x of the x values and then a vector c of the coefficients of the polynomial. So depending on the degree of the polynomial, this can have more or less coefficients, but uh, it specifies the shape of the polynomial and this uh, function will return the y values uh, for that polynomial in those x values. Now, this is a very uh, uh, simple function to use to plot polynomials, but we cannot use it here because it needs the coefficient and our function just calls whatever function it receives with an x. So if we need to glue these two things together, we can use a, a, a new function. We can create this poly function that will generate a function for a polynomial uh, given the coefficients here. So this function is not actually computing the value of the polynomial, it's just generating the function that will do that. So what is that function? Is this one, poly x, that will return the result of this polyval function that we have in the library for x with those coefficients. And this poly fun function here returns the object of that function. So this may seem a bit weird because we have one function creating a new function and then returning it. But the advantage is that when we run, when we execute this function with a set of coefficients, this set of coefficients stays in memory and will be accessible from this function because this function is inside the other one. So this is part of the namespaces that are accessible to this function. So this function can see the coefficients that exist here and because this function can see these coefficients, they will persist in memory. The result is that, for example, we can create this f function, which is the result of the polyfunk with one, two, three. This will be the, the, the three coefficients, so uh, uh, the constant x and x squared, for example. Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, this will stay in memory. So when we call f with some uh, value of x, f will use those coefficients that it re uh, this, uh, uh, received when it was generated. We can do the same thing with this function g with a new set of coefficients. So now this f and g functions only need the x value because both of them can access these values in memory when they were generated. And so we can use the other function and do the, the plot like it. So basically function closure allows you to uh, fit together different parts of the program or different functions that you have, even if they don't have the correct argument, you just need to have some wrapper function that solves that problem, and then from the outside it seems that everything is working. Okay? So remember that you can have some additional values specified and persistent in memory when some function is generated, and have that function uh, be able to access those values. <coughs> okay, so now uh, We'll just finish with uh, one uh, a bit more complicated, something a bit more complicated, but uh, a lot more powerful, which is uh, classes. So far, we've been dealing with objects in Python, so everything in Python is an object, and it's useful because you have the string as that split method, and the, the, the arrays as things to, to convert, to reshape, and things like that. And so the, the idea of creating objects is very good because it allows us to structure the code in a more intuitive manner in which we put the appropriate functions with the, with the same, the data that is going to be used by those functions. So when your code starts to get complex, if it's very simple, we, all we need is functions and we can do everything with functions. We also can do complex code with functions, but as things start getting more complicated, it's useful if we can create our own object. So classes in Python are there are also objects in, in Python, but this can uh, uh, give some rise to some confusion because usually in object-oriented programming, classes and objects are very different things, but in Python, classes are also objects. But in any case, what you need to, to remember is that class, when you create a class, this is a, a, a factory for objects. This produces objects. And what you specify here are the methods and attributes of the object. 
So those things like the split on the string and the, and the reshape on the array and things like that are methods specified by the class of those objects. One important method, which is a special method that Python will use, is this init method with two underscores before and two underscores afterwards. This one will be executed when a, a new object is created to assign values to everything that is particular to that object and is not, is not shared by all the objects of the same class. So from the same class, each object can have different attributes, for example, different strings can have different text inside them, but they are all strings, they are all of the same class. Uh, and all the methods that you write here, so uh, in general, but we can consider that that's all in practice, uh, will start with the, having the first uh, argument, that the first parameter here will receive as an argument a reference to the object itself. So the way Python works is that when you call a method from an object, Python will call the function here that is defined in the class and will tell that function which object is calling it. So for example, this printval method here that belongs to the object has one argument which is called self. Uh, this is a convention uh, because it's the, the object itself. Uh, and uh, this is the, the argument that the interpreter will, that Python will put in there, although we call the, the method with no argument. So all methods in an object will always receive the object itself as the first argument. So they know which object is calling them. But this is done implicitly by the interpreter and we don't need to do it explicitly. So what we're doing here, we have a simple uh, class called my class. Uh, initializing, we receive a value uh, to put into the object. So when we create a new object, we have to call my class and uh, provide some value, for example, 34 here. This method, the new, new object is created, and this method is executed with this argument, but before the argument, Python inserts a reference to the object that was recently created. So this self variable will have a reference to that new object. And now we can do this, we can create an attribute in the object called value, and we copy the value there. So now the object remembers the value uh, it got when it was created. Another method that we have here, it simply prints my value is, and then the value of the object that called this method. So if we cre create an object with the value 34, and we ask for the, the result of this function, print val, there is no result returned, there is no return there, but this prints my value is 34. So the, the object remembers the value and can uh, print out things. So let's see a, 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 a slightly more uh, elaborate example. We can create this fraction class, uh, and the initialization receives two uh, optional arguments. The numerator, which uh, by default is zero, and the denominator, by default, is one. So if we want to create a, a fraction of, say, five over 25, we can do it like this. We can create a fraction and, and say we want five uh, 25th of the, of the unit. So this is 5 over 25. Now we can create a, a method for the, the fraction object that automatically simplifies the fraction. And this is done by uh, getting the denominator and the numerator. This is basically we, we are um, uh, computing the modulus of the remainder of the division uh, from A and B. And uh, we can we keep doing this until uh, the the uh, remainder is zero. So until they become equal or they become both one or something like that. So using this, we find the largest common common divisor between the two. And now we can simplify the the fraction by dividing by the uh, largest common divisor. So for example, between five and twenty-five, the largest common divisor is five, and we can divide both of them by five. So this is what we do here. We create 525, we simplify, and now we have the numerator is 1 and the denominator is 5. So this is 1 fifth, uh, it's the same fraction. Why is this sort of thing useful? Because this way we are uh, uh, storing away or we are organizing our code 
in which, uh, in a manner that places all these functions inside the object that uses them, so inside one object, and we, uh, and it makes it much simpler to work with the object. So we don't have an additional simplify function that will simplify the object, uh, the value and return a new value, or something like that. We just call simplify of the object and that takes, takes care of everything. And now we can also uh, create, uh, there are the special functions, for example, this one called uh, str uh, uh, underscore underscore str underscore underscore. This is used by uh, things like print or this kind of representation when we use print or when we show the value in the console. If you define this function, you can specify how your object is presented when it's represented as a string. So we want to have the numerator and then a divide sign and then the denominator. This would be the representation of our object. And now if we create our fraction, 525, if we print it, we get the, the result in this representation. If we simplify and print, then we, re, uh, we converted the fraction to one fifth. So these, these methods belong to the object and we can use it. And now we can also uh, overload operators. This is another useful thing. Uh, when Python finds, for example, the plus sign to add two things, what uh, the interpreter does is to uh, execute this add method, so underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore. All these methods that have start and end with two underscores are special for, uh, for Python. So this is the method that is executed whenever Python finds uh, a sum between values. If you create an object that implements the sum between different objects, then you can actually use the sum operator to operate with them. For example, in this case, we're going to create a new fraction that has the, uh, uh, the uh, numerator uh, multiplied by the denominator plus the numerator of the other multiplied by the denominator of this one. This is what we're going to add together and the denominator will be the product of the two denominators. So this is how we add fractions. Uh, the lower part will be the product of the two of them and then the upper part will be the sum of the product cross. And now we simplify this fraction because they, they may have a common divisor, we can simplify the fraction and this is the result of adding two fractions. So now we can actually uh, add two fractions like this. We created uh, 5 over 25, 3 fifths and now we print the first one, the second one and the, the resulting fraction. So you can see that 5 over 25 plus 3 over 5 is equal to 4 fifths because this did the computation and then simplified the fraction. So this way you can also uh, overload the, the operators, for example, the same for multiplication. This is the way to multiply fractions. And uh, uh, from this point on, you can actually operate with your object. So if you're dealing with some kind of data where it's useful to have this kind of operation, for example, by adding things together, you can, you can increase the, uh, the number of data points or doing something like that. Then if you implement this as a class, it makes it simpler to uh, write code using uh, that data. <coughs> So lots of different reasons for uh, creating objects. Uh, when you create a class, you are uh, organizing all the code that is useful to deal with that data. And you can organize it in a way that makes it easier to use that code from the data. So uh, all those things that we use that are useful in Python uh, when we operate with strings, with matrices, with lists and so on, where we can add elements to the list, or we can change the case in the, in the string, all those functionalities. If you find it useful for your data, then uh, it's a good idea to write th that as an object and put all those functions inside the class so you can access them in the object. Uh, you can also uh, use objects to store different types of values. For example, here in the fraction, each fraction has two different values, numerator and denominator, and they are kept separate inside the objects and organized internally. So you could have an arbitrary number of values. You can, you can use uh, these kinds of objects to store uh, very complex data and then to, to handle that data without having then to worry constantly where the different values are and so on. 
So basically, when, you, uh, when things start to get more complicated objects and uh, creating classes and implementing things as objects can allow you to simplify the code uh, significantly and uh, uh, build uh, complex code over all those pieces without things becoming uh, too difficult to manage. The class is basically a recipe for creating objects and uh, the objects combine both data and uh, uh, code, those, those methods. So uh, it's easier to organize your programs like that. So to sum up, uh, there is some increasing level of, of complexity in these, uh, all these constructs, but uh, essentially those first things that, that we saw on the first day, variables, functions, loops, and conditions, with, with that basic set of, uh, of tools, you can do a lot of things. The, uh, as you uh, start building things that are more complex, it may be useful to learn libraries where uh, the code is already made, so it's, used, uh, it's easier to use the code, or these more advanced uh, uh, constructs in, in Python that make it easier to organize your code. So remember that you can, you can divide code into different modules and then import what you need from different parts. This is, is especially useful if your code starts to become larger. You don't want everything in the same file because it starts, it's not practical. Uh, also, you can use objects and classes to organize things better. Uh, and uh, so basically, from this core, you can start learning whatever you need as things uh, uh, get more complicated. But uh, at this stage, you should have a general ide idea of how to solve the majority of, of problems that you, that you can find for for data processing, so that, that would be the, the goal here. From here on, there's always, uh, there will always be things to learn, but that's, that's one of the good things about any subject, but uh, if you need uh, some help in the future, you can, you can contact me or, or, and I can, I can try to help.